Welcome to our wearables audio design fundamental session. The outlines of presentations are Telco system overview, Telco system basics, provisioning and calling. Then requirements. We'll get into details of how audio system can be designed based on what we have described in our previous sessions. And we'll wrap up with an example use case. This is a typical end to end telco system. 4G, 5G is a packet voice system. And all the audio processing takes place on the endpoints. The endpoints could be any form factor that has an IMS client sitting on a device. Uh, IMS is a IP multimedia subsystem. On the network side, there are these SIP servers, S SIP server, P SIP, P SIP server, and I SIP servers. And they are responsible for basically for terminating a call uh, between the talking to the between the two networks if they are not on the same operator's network. These two endpoints could be within the country, within the same operator or on a different operators or anywhere in the global. These SIP servers are responsible for and it's part of the IMS. It also has a, a user credentials, which is basically responsible making sure that it identify who the user is, whether the device has been provisioned and what applications user has subscribed. 5G is a service based architecture and these endpoints depending on what they have subscribed uh, are capable of apart from telco capable of subscribing other services so the first thing we need to do is we need to provision a de device provisioning means we need to make sure that we can get a network access and in order to provision a device we need to get a there is an element in a device called a sim or eSIM or iSIM, and that need to be activated. For every device, you have to have that in order to communicate to the network and provision the device. And once you provision the device, then you are able to access the services that you will be asking from the network or from the service providers. So provisioning is basically how you can access the network services. Each device comes with a either a, a physical SIM or an eSIM, which is embedded inside a device, or an iSIM which is integrated inside SOC. Basically, purpose is to allow device to communicate to the network. So all the billing, access management, all before we, we can subscribe the services, device has to be activated. So when you subscribe a service, what network does is each eSIM or iSIM device comes with this unique number called EID or IMEI. When network provision these device, network basically pair or link IMEI with a unique number called ICC ID. And ICC ID is integrated circuit card identifier. Network assigns to that. Could be 19 to 22 digit. Actually 19 to 32 digits. That's how this, this could be. And once a device is provisioned, then it's given a unique 15 digit number, which represents a mobile country code, three digits, two to three digits operator code, and then 10 digit is basically a number which we usually know and call a phone number. There are two eSIM architecture, a consumer eSIM and M2M eSIM. Why we are describing that here? Because we are talking about wearables and a given wearables could be an IoT device or could be a consumer device, which means a smartwatch is an example where a smartwatch need to make a phone call. So that has to have a consumer type of architecture. Uh, in a consumer architecture, basically users should be able to provision a device or request for a device or invoke provisioning. The eSIM has this local provisioning agent called LPA, uh, which either can come with a, a bootstrap profile, pre burn bootstrap profile for a particular operators and that bootstrap profile basically triggers the profile download profile is 
a network credentials. Network allows device to communicate to the outside world or in within the network. There is a another server called SMDS. It's a subscriber management discovery server. This discovery server, either it can be GSMA discovery server, it could be MNO operators. And during the manufacturing, uh, this LDS can talk to, it's basically an address, go, can go and talk to this discovery server. And then say if it's from a particular OEM, uh, the OEM can burn an address there during manufacturing of a device or can request the EUM, which is the original equipment manufacturer to burn uh, or to store that address inside the EOICC. And that allows to talk to SMDS. SMDS then can go and depending on the various operators within the country or global, they can store that those addresses or they can basically program during device activation. For example, we go to Apple store. Apple can ask which network operator you want to activate this device to, and they can basically go and talk to the network and allow their bootstrap profile downloaded to the device. So that way, basically, each uh, OEM can maintain their SMTS. However, this doesn't really help consumers. It's unnecessarily adding a cost. On end to end, the consumer arch architecture where user has to initiate device provisioning. So, uh, uh, M2M devices may or may not have display. These are tiny devices, for example, power meter, car, or any device that's a data-driven device. Healthcare, basically a band, and you wanted to communicate to the network. <clears throat> they come with the M2M eSIM. These devices comes with a bootstrap profile, profile pre-provision bootstrap profile, and which means each EOICC will have a bootstrap profile that can talk to the MNO. Or MNO use this, their bootstrap profile to talk to, if this device need to be, say, Verizon has a bootstrap profile stored on a device, but then device is sold in different market or is, they are selling it in a different market. And they can come to Verizon or at and and then at and allows this device to communicate to their SMSR and download their profile. This adds unnecessarily cost. And it's very difficult to build with this way a single SKU device. The GSMA has our standard body has decided that instead of having a consumer, and an M2M architecture. Consumer has on the network side SMDB plus server, and on the M2M, they have a different architecture. So you have to have a SMSR, as you can see that, and then from the SMSR, you can go and talk to their uh, DP server. They combine these two, consumer and M2M, and from the network point of view, it's now one, they don't need to have two separate provisioning servers. It will be one server and same device can be as a consumer or as a I2I, uh, M2M. So this is a new uh, standard just coming up. Now I was talking about physical SIM, embedded SIM and integrated SIM. Physical SIM requires a lot of real estate in a device. Same is the eSIM. You have to have a, a SIM card that's basically soldered into the PCB. That again takes a physical space. On the other hand, the integrated SIM, which is basically a SIM subscriber identity model, but it's embedded inside the SOC. So you don't need to have basically a separate physical space for the eSIM. So it has the same advantage as eSIM but it's more durable and tamper-proof. 
and even smaller than eSIM, it's built right into SOC. So of course, it reduces the cost and it has no impact on device design, including no PCB space. The operator profile could be provisioned on a module during the chipset manufacturing. Same as eSIM. Basically, network operator can say, OK, can I have a bootstrap profile? And you can have a bootstrap profile from multiple operators. And the key benefit here is we could have this a single SKU device. So it's a cost effective solution, environmental friendly. How do we invoke uh, basically calling? In a traditional telephone system, basically there is a dial pad when we enter a phone number and then we press the send button, it's invoking a SIP protocols. And SIP protocols, what it does basically, there are SIP messages. It sends an invite to basically there is an IMS server sitting on a network. And it checks basically whether the device is provision, it uh, has paid the bill, and when all that are done, then it's basically initiates these SIP messages, and it sends a message to this invite message to the foreign party. Foreign party challenge the calling party that, hey, do you support, which is called a SDPC, session description protocol, it's basically asking, asking the other device, do you support this speech coding rate or this particular speech coder? Uh, what's the packet size you should be using? And so these two endpoints negotiate it via the SDP protocols. And once that happens, then it sends this ringing message. There is an acknowledgement goes in between. And then ringing messages basically then see that, yes, once they have agreed on uh, the coding rate, the packet size, then the ringing take place. So it's a start ringing the foreign device. And once the foreign device rings, user picks up the call, the foreign user, and it sends a 200 OK message, followed by an acknowledgement. And when that happens, then the from the SIP, the media protocol starts transmitting the voice packets. Basically, hello, and then you receive a hello from the far end, and the media sends, you are start sending a voice packets. Once these voice packets, what, during the call, any party, either the calling party or receiving party can terminate a call. So they send, and they can press an end button, or uh, go to the off hook, the old language where you have a switch hook there. But these days on these digital phones, it's basically uh, you send a few end a key call on the soft key, and that will send a by message to the device that has uh, not terminated the call, followed by an OK, and momently network sees that the IMS, it just disables the call or terminates the call. Uh, so that's on the traditional one. On the app, same thing happened. You don't have a physical uh, dial pad, but you have list of the directory. Uh, you have a name of an individual. You go there, select the name, and you can do the same thing. So in this case, the app is taking place of that. But again, underline, it's the same. Call origination, call origination, call terminations. Uh, these are the SIP messages. And for media packets, the RTP. This is the end-to-end -end view of a typical telco system. What takes place on the endpoints? Endpoints as radio, an IMS client, and then there is a UDP uh, for media protocols. And then there is an, an audio engine sitting on a device. This is a, an example of a smartphone view. These are the audio processing we call in a digital system today or in a typical Volti or VNR voice over NR or even voice over Wi-Fi. On a wearables, uh, 
specifically if the watch is being used as a pair device to the smartphone. So we will need to implement uh, up until, so you are doing all the packet processing on a device, mobile device, and then you are sending uh, coded bits to a uh, PCM data to Bluetooth device through the Bluetooth interface, and all the audio processing need to be taken place on the wearable side. It is likely in future we will see that all the processing. So IMS will take place on if the device is not a standalone. Uh, then you can do all these RTP everything processing on the endpoints. And why that is required to reduce the latency on the uh, overall uh, endpoints. The only difference between 5G and 4G here will be uh, 5G radio interface will reduce the latency uh, significantly on each end by uh, for LT you need a 10 millisecond, for LT it will be a one millisecond. So you can uh, eliminate latency by about one speech frame that is around 10 millisecond, 20 millisecond. Uh, precisely it's about 18 millisecond. So to split the latency here between the endpoints network, uh, the total requirement, which we'll be discussing here, but I wanted to discuss it here is, uh, it will be 150 millisecond based on the G, uh, ITU G114. And so network has a budget of 30 to 40 millisecond, because these endpoints, these are packet-based systems. They have to have uh, processing. So network, cannot exceed more than basically 50 millisecond each. And then we add the air interface. So 50, 50 and the air interface plus the network processing, 50 millisecond. That's the budget for the network. In terms of the key requirements, typical uh, audio front end, uh, KPIs are bit width and sampling rate. Device shall be capable of handling 16 to 32 bit width. 8 to 48K sampling rate, depending on the use cases. Dynamic range, 120 dB, we'll be talking about that. And for telco devices, wearables, hearables, and music, uh, these are the typical uh, SNRs. In terms of the gain that uh, you will need in the front end, up to 36 dB, either 0.5 dB, and we'll say why that the 5 dB is. When we were discussing about auditory system and uh, if you remember from there, the 0.5 dB is the minimum we need to have. In terms of the speaker driver, uh, we need to have class D, class H and G. Class D will be primarily for hearables, sorry, wearables and smart speakers. Class D and H will be for hearables. The jitter for music, because they will be at higher sampling rate. So you have to have below 50, 30, 30 picosecond jitter for telco below 50 picoseconds and for keyword spotting where AI is not that sensitive with the quality. So under 20 nanosecond should be the clock jitter. What are the typical downlink requirements? This is the mask that we receive from the 3GPB, TS26, 131, 132. And there will be masks for narrowband, wideband and super wideband. So this is just uh, for a wideband. Uh, receive, receive loudness and loudness, since we are talking about the receive, so we have to have a, a loudness of for wearables 13 plus minus three, for hearables three plus minus. Uh, frequency mass, the device shall meet this particular frequency mass. Idle channel noise, these are the requirements. Uh, volume settings for STMR is a, it's a cytone masking ratio. Cytone is when you are speaking specifically for the headset. You need to know basically what you are speaking. Otherwise, it looks like a, uh, you are not talking to somebody. 
So there are requirements for that, and it's uh, 18 plus minus 5 dB. Site on latency, you don't want to hear uh, echo, so it has to be under 10 millisecond. So these are the requirements for downlink. Downlink is basically you are receiving signal from far end. Network is sending you to the packets, so that's a downlink. Uplink, it's basically from radio to the network. So there is a there are three masks again for narrowband, wideband, and super wideband. So this is again for wideband only. Uh, there will be a corresponding mass for the wideband and super wideband and narrowband on a TS26131132 requirement. And these are the again MOS, SLR, RFR, and noise. And these are straight from the network, except this is we are specifying this is the MOS score. MOS is basically if you take a polka. That's a standard specified on the network. So these are, you have to have these quality requirements. Latency uh, in terms of the call uh, origination, origination uh, basically a signaling. Device to network shall be to under 20 millisecond, device to device when you are making a phone call. So you should be able to establish the connection under 250 millisecond. Now it looks like a lot, but it is not because there are two or three back and forth going network is device is talking to the network network then decides whether or not the device has been provisioned then it goes and it's query the another network then the another network see if that device is provisioned and after it has identified that then it goes and sends a invite message to a device then the far end device challenge to the near end device uh, with the sdp protocol and so there is a back and forth, back and forth. So this shall be under 250 millisecond. It could be less, but that's uh, depending on where uh, in the uh, global this these two uh, devices could be. Uh, mouth to ear, uh, which is when you speak and somebody is hearing during a session, which means this is a RTP, uh, that latency shall be under 150 millisecond. Uh, device to network latency, uh, in the send direction under 35 millisecond, in the receive direction again under 20 millisecond. Echo. Echo is when you have a device, acoustic device, and there is a feedback from loudspeaker to the mouth, and that's basically acoustic echo. You need to have an acoustic echo canceller on a device. In olden days, during a PSTN, actually, we didn't need to have an acoustic echo because the latency was so small and the distance between microphone and speaker was significant, like those big uh, handsets. So there was already a significant loss. So echo was masked by the cytone because the latency was under, it was a circuit switch. The latency was under 10 millisecond or 20 millisecond. And the network needed to do a micro cancellation on the network side. However, because we have a significant latency, we are talking about 150 millisecond. You cannot really afford having a echo coming from the device. Then once it's traveled through the network, it will become a larger echo tail. So you will need a bigger echo canceller at the far end to cancel this line echo. Therefore, every Volti device today, or VNR, voice over NR, or voice over Wi-Fi device, or wipe has to have an echo canceller on a device. And so there is a requirement that this the echo canceller followed by a non-linear part, it has a linear and non-linear, it must, have greater than 60 dB TCL W terminal coupling loss with it. So that's that's echo requirement. In terms of the clock jitter, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the clock jitter is directly proportional to the distortion on the DAC or on the ADC, which is basically a sampling jitter. And this must be for telco under 50 millisecond in order to achieve SNR over 110 dB for 16K, 16 bit width. If you are using a 48K uh, sampling rate, then the jitter requirement will be even lesser, and that may be the 30 picosecond in that case. So, uh, the key objective on any telco device is reduce echo, latency, and distortion in order to enhance the quality. Therefore, for manufacturers, or those who are designing these devices, including, of course, the uh, chipset vendors. Uh, these three things are essential. Reducing uh, the processing latency, 
but when you are packaging all this together, efforts need to be made to reduce the distortion and latency. So that was uh, about the requirements. Now let's come back to how we can really uh, design a system. So this is a, a block representation of a typical telco system, whether it's a hearables, wearables, or smart speaker. If it's a device does not have a UI, then it won't have the UI, but it will have all these blocks there. There will be an audio engine, which will need to implement all these algorithms. And we'll be talking about uh, how you will design echo canceller, noise reduction, equalizations, and DRC. So, and then what's the control code you will need to control these devices? Now, on wearable, there is only one mode called a speakerphone mode. If we take a, a typical smartphone case, a smartphone has a little bit different. A smartphone has a headset uh, you are pairing with. It will have a handset mode. It will have a speakerphone mode, and it will have a TTI mode. Uh, but here, it will be only a single mode. So, which means uh, uh, if you are on a smartphone, you will need to download these parameters based on the which mode you have. Over here, it's just a one mode. So you just download the parameters, and uh, they can be pre-provisioned in the device. When you are designing an audio system, we need to take into consideration the real-time aspect. Audio system is a hard real-time system. It means a speech coder has to have a data received every speech frame. Most of the Bluetooth speech coders today, LC3, for example, will require packets coming every 10 millisecond. If it's AMR wideband or EBS, there will be a 20 millisecond packets coming, which means if network cannot send a packet to the speech coder every 20 millisecond or 10 millisecond, a mechanism has to be there to conceal those packets. And if these packets are not coming on, on consistent rates, then there has to be a mechanism for absorbing that jitter, means de-jittering that. So in a system, you need to allocate time slots for processing. Because Packets are coming every 10 millisecond or 20 millisecond. It means all the processing need to be take place on that boundary of 10 or 20 millisecond. So real, real time need to be allocated accordingly. And this is what basically we are uh, specifying here. The next one is the loss plan. Uh, before you even start mucking around with your, or messing up with the, or you start doing the tuning. And we'll discuss that uh, later in the session. Uh, you wanted to make sure that you understand the capabilities and limitations of your acoustics. So the first thing you want to do is, what's the mic sensitivity? How much gain I need to apply on the microphone path and on the downlink path? If I have a microphone sensitivity, say for example, minus 45 dBb, to be 5.62 millivolts, then you wanted to make sure that you have enough headroom so when you are speaking on microphone, the speech and sine wave has a different cross factor. So you wanted to give that head peaked to average ratio. That's a cross factor. Make sure that the peaks are not getting saturated. So the front end gain must correspond to that you are not saturating the peaks. And there could be a variation from speaker to speaker. So that need to be taken into consideration. So basically the front end, uh, Designer job is to ensure that, or the tuning engineer job is to ensure that under all circumstances that you do not saturate the front end. Because anytime you have a saturation in the front end, your audio system will get messed up. And that's where we'll, we'll talk about. So care must be taken to distribute the gain properly so that you do not saturate the front end and echo coupling can be minimized. So that was architecture on how what are the various architecture you will need. Now, the first thing we want to see that the first algorithm is a VAT. When you are doing a noise reduction, you want to identify whether this particular speech segment is a voice or unvoiced. The VAT will be handy there. Or when you are doing a keyword spotting on real-time system, you need to know whether this is a, a speech or this is not a speech so that you can preserve the bandwidth and you can preserve the battery also. As I mentioned earlier uh, during our uh, previous sessions that our mind processes signal every 10 millisecond. 
The reason for that is we need to have, we were talking about the pitch. Our mind does not really process or perceive the signal in fundamental frequency rather than it, it looks on the, it understands based on the pitch. And for identifying the pitch, you have to have a minimum of five millisecond. But precisely to get two peaks, you have to have a 10 millisecond of chunk data. So that's why this, anytime you are designing a VAT, make sure that your minimum window is 10 millisecond. Uh, in terms of the system intelligibility and bandwidth, and I promised you last time that we will come back on this diagram later on. Uh, why bandwidth, intelligibility, and relative loudness and these spectrums are useful? Just recap on what we described last time around. For a voice, the bandwidth is from 150 hertz to wide band will go up to 6700 hertz or 7500 hertz, and super wide band will go up to 16k. For a music, from 50 hertz all the way to basically 20k. So that's the bandwidth when we are processing it. In terms of the loudness, when we are applying again on the front end, so we talk about the dynamic range. We will be utilizing that. How do we really control the dynamic range in a digital system? So this graph shows that how much really we need to process the signal. We really never need to go beyond 100 dB SPL. In terms of the bandwidth, we need a lower energy, lower bands for loudness, and we need a higher bands for intelligibility. So now let's see how we design our DRC energy. DRC is a dynamic compression. So there's basically there is a compression, which is for the louder signal, and there is an expansion, which is for the softer signal. And that way you can increase the dynamic range of a system. So you don't need to basically, if you are talking really loud or somebody is talking really loud, does the system need to process that signal? All you want to do is convey the message at the far end that you are speaking intelligibly. So threshold of hearing is a 0 dB as a SPL, and threshold of pain is a 120, 130 dB. We never need to go that far. What we need to comfort zone is basically where our system dynamic range is. For a typical conversation, it's somewhere between 65 to 75 most of the time when we are doing a normal conversation. But it could go anywhere from 50 to 90 dB, depending on how loud or how soft you are talking or what kind of a ambient conditions you are speaking in. So it's very important to understand when you are analyzing the device, you know what the flow noise is. and typical uh, sound chamber that people use for telco, 10 to 20 dB SPL will be what your flow noise will be. Uh, in ambient conditions, uh, 40 dB is a typical background noise when you are in a typical office environment. It could go up to 55, depending on where you are. For example, cafeteria, coffee shop. A lot of people who are talking, uh, your slow noise can go up. Therefore, when you are designing a DRC, noise suppressor, AGC, you take all these into consideration. So let's take an example of this is a, say you have a dynamic range here that you are defining between A and B. B and C are the data points, or these are the threshold here, which is minus 56 dBm zero here uh, in this particular example. and if the signal is below this, then you will do the noise reduction or expense. That's where you see this nonlinearity here. If the signal is within this range, and so this is for the sending direction. If you are receiving the signal you want, and you are wearing a headset, when somebody is talking 20 dB softer at the far end, you really don't want to crank up your volume up and down. You wanted to maintain your signal at set target level or volume level. So your AGC, what you will do on your wearable device or even a wearable device is you maintain the loudness no matter how loud or soft foreign guy is talking. So that way your uh, usability experience doesn't really change. So this will be the AGC range. And for the compression, if the signal is really loud, you don't want to process it. Therefore, you want to compress it. So the compressor is to reduce unwanted signal getting into the network. So basically you are Preventing signal getting saturated into the digital domain. So you have to basically compress the signal. There are multiple ways to do that. You can reduce the front end gain. And here is an example. You can have 
an automatic label controller, but there are drawbacks of doing that. This will work okay in a headset, but not on if you are on a speakerphone type device or hands-free device. So you can automatically measure the peak and average ratio here and adjust your PJ again. This will guarantee it. you will not saturate at the input of the ADC. But you could do that in the software by dropping the gain here, and that's another mechanism. So this is basically the dynamic range compression. So the dynamic range compression, what it is doing is it's a it's a sending signal within a specified target range, uh, upper limit and lower limit. If the signal goes below certain threshold, it reduces this. If its signal is above that, compresses. And AGC is in between for uh, enhancing your conversation, regardless of what the loudness at the far end of the speaker voices. Mixer, the purpose of the mixer is basically mixing signals, which could be in different volume settings or sampling rate and between. For example, music, you might be on a voice call, which is 16 kilohertz, 16 bit width, but the music you are playing at 24 bit width and 48K sampling. And same thing with the polyringer could be a 44.1, uh, kilohertz sampling rate and bit width 60. So the mixer job is to make sure that before you mix them, they all are same signal. So you downsample it if it's from being played at a higher sampling rate uh, volume, you reduce the volume. So make all these guys the same. So it has an algorithm basically that's controlling, manipulating the volume and sampling rate. So that's basically the purpose of the mixer. Audio bandwidth, as uh, we described, there are three mode or in Talco, narrow band, wide band, and super wide band or full band. So this is the narrow band bandwidth. This is the wide band bandwidth. And this one is a super wide band bandwidth. And full band is where you are using all the way from 50 hertz to 22K. And this is where when you are designing a system, your system should be capable of handling all these sampling rates. Now let's take an example of a Talco. This is the typical frequency response for a hi-fi audio. Like you have a music system, and you may want to blast it really loud. So this is, if you select a speaker, it must provide you 3 dB cutoff somewhere around 50 hertz, and then it can, it should go all the way to 20K. That will be for hi-fi audio. For hearables, 150 hertz to around 16 kilohertz, 16 k. And for hearables, hearables cannot generate a low frequency. Sorry, wearables cannot generate a low frequencies, and we'll come back on that. So this will be the bandwidth for a typical wearable device. Now coming back on the sending direction. On the sending direction, this is again for hi-fi audio. Uh, you will need a full bandwidth. So this is a typical frequency response for if you are using a full band. For super wide band uh, speech, this will be the, that's basically the bandwidth, and this is how your frequency response will look like. And this is for wearable device, like a smartwatch. Coming back to the acoustic echo canceler design now. So we have described about the ERC mixer and the equalization. Why we talk about the equalizations? Because your speaker sometime or your microphone acoustic sometime may not be designed to give you the frequency response you need. So equalization will be important. And you may need uh, a cascaded bike quartz to provide you uh, the desire to tune the desired frequency response. And you may need anywhere from five to 12 bike quartz, depending on your system capabilities, depending on the real time you have. So minimum, definitely you need to have a five and you can go up to the 12 by quartz, of course, more it's better, but that takes more real time and uh, it adds latency as well as uh, real time in the system memory. So both in the receive side and send side, you have to have some kind of a cascaded by quartz. Echo canceller, as I mentioned earlier, that you have to have a an echo canceller on all modern telco devices. There are two parts of an AC acoustic echo canceller. You have a a linear part, which is usually a, a typical LMS based. I mean, these days there are different designs, but we are just picking one. I would call that adaptive filter, basically. So it's a filter that's constantly adapting uh, to the echo path. And once it's adapted, it copies these into the echo cancel filter, which is basically a fur filter, uh, FIR. 
and it generates a replica of this echo based on the reference signal it receives, and then it cancels out. So that's basically what uh, echo canceler. And then uh, if you have a residual echo left, then you apply a nonlinear part, and that nonlinear part will suppress the residual echo. So that's basically the echo cancel part. Then you have a noise also, ambient noise, and you have to reduce that noise or cancel that noise. So you have to have a noise suppression in the chain in the uplink. So, so that your echo is eliminated, your noise is eliminated, and the only signal you have left is the desired speech signal. So AC enables basically a high quality full duplex voice communication in the endpoint. If you don't have AC, you will have a half duplex behavior, or you may have a clipping or choppiness in the conversation. Now let's take how do we design echo canceler. So AC has a linear part, which is this guy here, and a nonlinear part. And this everything is called basically AC. I'm putting downlink DRC as a part of AC. It does not help us much in the downlink DRC, but it helps much to the enhancement of the AC performance. Because these are small speakers, and these speakers cannot generate low frequencies, but we are doing everything to get the loudness we need. So means uh, you have to apply heavy compression. If you put this AC, DRC up here, echo canceler wouldn't know that, and it will end up causing non-linearity in the front end. So DRC has to be basically optimized based on the echo path. So that's why I put it on a, as a part of uh, AC. So acoustic can, echo canceler can be a full band or a sub band. You will need a full band when you are echo tail. Echo tail is basically how big is this echo? How long does it basically the tail length? And if it's under 10 milliseconds, then you will use a full band echo canceler because then you do you can use a, a smaller filter to adapt to the echo path and it's easy to basically adapt to. Uh, if you have a larger echo tail, then you are splitting echo into a smaller and a smaller subbands and then doing kind of a parallel processing there. And that way you can uh, model echo quickly. So if you have echo, um, uh, echo tail, say 20, 30, or 50, uh, even in a variable form factor, uh, you have to have a subband or frequency domain or some other type of echo canceler uh, that can quickly model the echo. So here is an example. Uh, how many taps you will need. So for example, if you have a 16K sampling rate, then you will need a 480 taps if you use a just a full band echo canceler. Now let's take an example uh, into an algorithm. So for wearables, you will need a subband, depending on whether you have a narrow band, wide band, or super wide band. So this particular example is assuming that you have a full band echo canceler. Sorry, you have a Full band signal means you are processing all 24 bark bands. So basically you will need a smaller echo canceler on every bark band. So you can take, say you have a 50 millisecond and divide it by that into the bark bands and each band will take that much of echo tail. And so you will model echo. And this is here is an equ equation basically that you are adopting and this is typical LMS algorithm and it models echo once it energy is stronger than what you have in the previous case then you will copy previous coefficients into this guy and for example if the lms energy because when your coefficients are uh, adopted uh, it will show a stronger energy so say if it's 2 db stronger than the previous one you copy it uh, so that's basically a copy logic here uh, then you measure the ERL here. There is an ERL, which is how much return loss you need. So ERL, ERL is basically how much cancellation you are doing. This is the energy coming from, and then this is what you are generating, estimating echo. And this far out is basically near input minus far out, and that's your echo loss enhancement. Next one, you wanted to see basically how much NLP you need to apply. And to apply the NLP, here is an example basically. To apply the NLP, you are, so your ERL target is, means you are you need to cancel 
uh, echo need to be 6 dB below from here. If you have a downlink signal, this echo signal has to be that much down. If your coupling is, say, your energy coming to the microphone is 30 dB below, and your echo canceller is providing you 30 dB of ERL, means NLP just need to apply zero loss. So the way you will apply this NLP, you are measuring the, so echo loss on the NLP will be ERL minus ERL. And that's what, so ERL is basically how much total echo loss you are applying on every band and how well your echo cancel is doing and accordingly you will apply the loss here. So that's basically just uh, now coming back when you will determine whether you are on a double talk or a single talk. So one thing I was talking about is energy of the LMS cell. That's one when you are copying it. The other one is you can measure the correlation between at these two points. So when you have only downlink, it will be strongly correlated. A and B signal will be strongly correlated. So that's a downlink active signal. If you take a correlation of A and B and there is no signal in the downlink, of course, then it will be anti-correlated and this will be uplink active. Or you can just determine the energy here, energy here. And of course, if uplink energy is greater than downlink, you will say, okay, it's an uplink active. If there is energy here, energy here, and then you have a not a strong correlation, so the energy here is same as energy here, but they are strongly anti-correlated. This is a double talk scenario. At that time, what you do, you will freeze the coefficients. It means you will stop adopting. So go to the step size and just make a step size. You can either disable that or change the step size. So that way you slow down this. You scale the step size significantly that it will not adopt. So that's basically uh, how the copy logic and uh, double talk you will determine and then what i mentioned that nlp loss uh, is basically this erl minus erle so that's about designing of echo cancel of course there is a lot required on it but conceptually this is how you would design it noise cancellation acoustic noise cancellation is useful in the headset and automotive environmental noise cancellations are important in the telco so what acoustic noise cancellation is doing is it's cancelling the noise that you are hearing uh, environmental noise cancellation or ENC is is cancelling the noise that somebody at the far end is going to hear or you are transmitting to the far end. So in telco, we need to do them both. When you have a headset, you need to cancel the noise coming to your ear hearing. And then you also need to cancel the noise you are transmitting at the far end. And let's see how we can do that. Noise cancellation can be implemented into full band or sub band. You will need a microphone array. Again, I'm talking about the ENC. So you will need a fixed beam and adaptive beam. So let's see what we're talking here about. So this is a simple example of ANC. So what's happening in ANC is you have a signal that, if you remember that headset, so headset has a one microphone inside the, close to the ERP reference point. And then you have a, a microphone that's outside. The, um, on the listening noise at the far end, oh, sorry, outside. So what we need to do here is we have a signal that microphone is receiving in the ear. We model and there is a noise that a microphone is hearing. So there will be a level difference, but they will be in the same phase. We need to create, we need to add these two, two signals basically. So when it goes to the ANC block, what it is doing, it need to flip the phase. And once the phase is flipped, then you add it to the downlink. And once it's being played out acoustically, they are forming a destructive interference. And that's basically the concept of ANC. So it's modeling the ANC, is modeling anti-phase noise, adding that with the downlink. And then acoustically, it's being canceled. There is a strict latency requirement here. And if you remember, I was talking about the ITD, we talk about ILD, interaural time difference. And that interval time difference, the minimum just noticeable latency is 10 microseconds. So if you can make this everything work under 10 microseconds, this will not be noticeable. And you can have a decent acoustic noise cancellation. However, because uh, you have a A to D converter that will take some time, uh, you have a digital signal processing goes here because you are adapting to the noise. So this all. Uh, efforts need to be made that you wanted to reduce this 
or in sub 10 microseconds. So that's basically ANC and how this is basically here is happening is in a headset. Uh, there is a voice microphone. There is a microphone, which is an air reference microphone. Uh, sorry, air, air, sorry, error microphone, and this is a reference microphone. So ANC technique is used to improve the SNR by creating anti-phase noise for the listener. And the key requirement here is you cannot exceed beyond 550 microseconds. I said 10, if you can make it under 10, that would be the best. ENC, environmental noise cancellation, which is basically when you are, so what's happening here is this microphone and this microphone. We use these two microphones for ENC. This microphone and this microphone for ANC. So there are three microphones you are using, but two of them are using for ANC and two of them are using for, I mean, you can use more microphones, but that's just the minimum you will need. So again, the purpose of ANC is now to form constructive interference. If the signals, they are in the same phase, uh, you add them. If they are not in the same phase, so you subtract them. So that's basically what the basic concept of the beamforming. So constructive interference enhances the signal, destructive interferences reduce the signal instead, right? And beamforming is a technique used to improve the SNR by eliminating the undesired signal. So what beamforming do, doing is we have a microphone, primary microphone, and it's trying to basically form a beam that's closer to the, that's basically aligning towards the uh, speaker's mouth and preventing signal get being picked from surroundings. Oh. So it's ultimately beam forming is creating a beam pattern and how that can be done. So this is a typical uh, omni mic beam pattern and how we can create a, a fixed beam pattern. Uh, one way to do that, you take a single mic, then you design acoustics, which can create an artificial microphone. Basically, you take an omni mic and then have a, an acoustic tunnel where sound travels and artificially you create this acoustic tunnel and that will create a delay. And then it's a sum and delay uh, will form a some kind of a directional pattern. And that's basically a fixed beam. You can do the same thing with using a two microphones. You delay them or you tune this delay and then you sum. It will give you a fixed directional pattern. If you can make this adaptive, then that will call an adaptive beam pattern. So from Omni, which is basically a 360 degree, you are picking sound from. Uh, the directional microphone will pick signal from this particular direction. Uh, how we will design a multi-mic ANC, uh, ENC? Taking an example of three microphones. So the first thing we will do is we will form a fixed beam, and it's basically a delay and sum. So it's forming a constructive interference, uh, by creating this delay and sum. So what you will need to do is you will need to have an equalizer on every microphone path, then an echo canceller. Then you use this fixed beam former, delay and sum, and that's basically forming a fixed beam. Now you need to estimate a noise. And for estimating a noise, what we need to do is we need to create, so this is an example of blocking matrix. matrix. So what this blocking matrix is doing is basically it's collecting undesired signal. And then that undesired signal is being used to train this adaptive filter. And once it's trained to that, then it comes, it creates basically a replica of the unwanted signal, which get canceled. And that's basically what a typical noise cancellation algorithm will be. So blocking matrix is separating a desired signal from the undesired signal in this path. And basically, we are creating this noise signal that you will be receiving. So we receive the, we separate the desired signal and undesired signal, which is basically the noise. And we adopt to the filter to that based on this mechanism here. And that's basically creating a, a noise replica of the signal and it's canceling. Same concept, basically, what we use in the echo canceller or even in ANC. So that's about the ENC. Now, let's take an example that's keyword spotting. What we will need to do. So keyword spotting will be a, a pre-processing engine. For example, if you have a multi-microphone. So front end, 
you can tune train the front end and in terms of the pre-processing you will definitely need a that to determine whether you wanted to send the signal to the front end engine or not so VAD has a multiple use here. VAD is preserving the bandwidth of a signal going to the network. VAD is telling DRC when to apply the noise suppression uh, or to the noise suppressor uh, when it should be suppressing the noise or to this AI engine, whether it need to send the signal to AI engine or not. So this way it preserves the battery or overall power consumption. So these are the typical uh, uh, audio uh, blocks for keyword spotting, pre-processing block, AI engine, and encoder. That's about uh, overall audio system design. Now, the last topic I want to discuss here is tuning methodology. How you will, once you have designed the algorithms, so how you would tune it. Somebody may be offering you, providing you acoustics. Someone else may be providing you the solution. Uh, and you as an audio engineer need to tune a system. So how you will do that? So the first thing you may want to do is evaluate an acoustics that you have. By evaluating that, you are understanding the capabilities and limitations of that acoustics. Means you take a frequency response, you take an echo coupling, you take a loudness, and you take a noise. All You basically run through all the tests, and that will tell you basically what you need to do before you start messing around with the algorithm. Then next, what you want to do is you want to apply a loss plan. Acoustical evaluation, next one is a loss plan. And that loss plan is basically what kind of a DRC I need to apply? What kind of an equalization I need to do? How much gain I need to apply in the for this particular microphone or this particular loudspeaker system? So that's basically your loss plan. Then next one you want to do the coupling measurement, which is basically the energy from loudspeaker getting fed back to acoustically to the microphone. If it is a multi-mic, you want to measure it on every mic path. If it's a single, then you measure it there. And so once you have done the loss plan, you may have to redistribute your loss plan based on the echo coupling. And then you tune your system based on the echo coupling, loss plan, uh, equalizations, DRC. Then the next thing you want to do is you analyze the distortion on echo path because that's very important to understand. One way to do that when I was talking about acoustic transducers and I showed you the frequency versus the distortion, TSD plot. And so you can sweep a tone at different TSD level and plot that graph and that will tell you basically what frequencies are distorting. And you will use that to tune your compression. So that's basically for loss plan evaluation. Once you are done with that, then you can come back to your tuning. And so equalize for your microphone and a speaker to meet your GCF requirement or TS26131132 requirements. You optimize your, so downlink DRC is more for enhancing AC performance or you go back to that TSD and frequency sweep plot and then you tune your DRC for that purpose. Uplink DRC is more for, again, if you have a stronger coupling, a rule of thumb that I was mentioning that your uplink energy should be greater than the, your couple energy. If you don't have that, uh, you don't want to saturate in the front end. So which means you need to drop the front end gain to prevent saturation in the echo path. And for that, you may have to apply more compression because you have already dropped the front end gain, then you are boosting it at the outside, the echo path. And to prevent your signal getting saturated before it go to the, your encoder, uh, you may apply, you may need to apply the compression. And you never wanted to go beyond 12 dB of compression on an uplink. So once you are done that, then you come back and you optimize your echo canceller once you have done all the gain distributions. And once you optimize your echo canceller gain distributions, then you do further fine tuning. So those are basically steps you may need. This is an iterative process. You may need to go back and forth. And when we were talking about the instrumentation, there are three approach you need to know, you need to do. 
waveform analysis, which is basically how much echo coupling you have, how much, what is your frequency response and all that. Then you may want to analyze your MOS score. Basically, that's the best way to analyze the quality. And once you have all that done, then last step you want to do is subjective listening under different scenarios. So three steps for tuning, waveform, MOS, and then subjective listening. With that, thank you very much. It concludes our wearable telco audio system design fundamentals.